good evening. Welcome to Big Hill Christie Church where we're doing our going deeper study. To, this is, uh, this morning we talked about justification by faith in that we are doing a, a study on the book of Romans. We're in chapter 3 and um, we talked about obviously justification by faith this morning but we also uh, talked about the, the situation that we have in our relationship with the Lord and kind of challenged ourselves to consider what kind of faith we have or what degree of faith we have so what I'd like to do this evening as we as we start into the study first off welcome those of you who are who are watching uh, our live stream and keep in mind if you have any questions or comments you can send those to us on the site you know on our page here or at BHCC going deeper so that that being said let's let's ask a question and see what what we come up with this morning I started the message with, with the quote that faith in God changes everything. And I asked the question, like what? what? What changes do we see in our lives based on the faith that we have in God? And we used, we used two illustrations from other sections of Scripture that I'd, I'd like to kind of touch just a little bit this evening to, to kind of set the stage for where we are. The first one that we looked at this morning was in Acts 8.38, where Philip and a eunuch had, uh, had a conversation. The eunuch was going through Scripture and didn't know what he was reading, couldn't, couldn't understand it. Philip began by explaining the Scripture to him, sharing the Gospel with him, and as they were going down the road together, the eunuch made the statement in 838 that we see. He said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip basically said, nothing. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we'll baptize you. And they, and they did. Second passage of Scripture we looked at was in Matthew 611 where we were looking at the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus says to the disciples to, to, to pray in this manner. And one of the lines in, in that prayer is, give us this day our daily bread. And I ask the question, when we, when we say that phrase, when we pray that part of the prayer, what are we asking God for? Food? Or Jesus said, I am the bread of life. A spiritual growth, a, a closeness that we need that is only given to us by the Lord. And it says daily, something that we need every day, not just an oversupply of at one time, but a constant, repetitive growth. So with those two examples kind of under our belt this evening, <clears throat> what is it about the eunuch do you think would cause him to be in... in in such a, a frame of mind that as soon as he saw water, he saw the, uh, the, the opportunity to be baptized. Holy Spirit working on him. I, I believe that. And I, I believe if he, if he had had the scriptures explained to him in such a way that, that they actually came alive to him, and he saw Jesus not as a figure in a book or a story that had been generated by the people around this towns where, where Jesus had spoken and, and the reputation that he had, but he actually saw a living Christ giving him the opportunity to be righteous in God's sight. Now, the you know, first question this evening for you all is, do we have that? How many things do we see? How many, how many opportunities do, do we have in encounters in our daily life where we see the spiritual rather than, you know, the secular, if you will? You know, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, do we automatically look at the spiritual side of that or do we look at material provision being made for us? So when we say that faith in God changes everything, can we think of opportunities or situations or th times where that faith has actually changed, changed us? Do we think more in a spiritual context since we have our faith in God? Or is that something that we just think about when we have a 
a need for it. So what I'd like to do this evening is take a, take a look at what is our faith like and what, what are some of the changes that actually take place when we have faith in God? What, what changes in our lives actually happen? I think, first of all, our view of God changes. Think with me. What concept, what, what picture comes to mind when you consider who God is? All-knowing, all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent. You know, all of those things that is, is God. What, what if we change that from the concept of coming to a true realization that God does not fit our concept of who God is? He says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Do you think that, that maybe our faith suffers in, 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 the, in the thought that we don't really know God in, in, in the way that we, we want to? I mean, when we go to God in prayer, for example, when we're in a situation we don't have answers, we don't have direction, we, we don't know what's going to happen, and we go to God and pray, what do we expect God to be like? What do we expect him to do? How do we expect him to respond? The way we need, the way we want, right? What if we actually had such a great faith in God that we know that he is way beyond our concept of who he is and what he can do and we just lay ourselves at his feet and say, Lord, your will, your way. You know, this morning we looked at the illustration in, in Jeremiah 29, 11, where, where it, it said that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Lord knows the plans that he has for us. And some people interpret that as his will, his way, my faith. And when we look at that, we, we come to the realization that God's will will be done. We can't change God's will, no matter how hard we want something or need something or, or ask of him. But, you know, the, our, our scriptures tell us that we, we are told whatever we pray in accordance with God's will, he will do. How do we know what the will of God is? You see, what, and I went to Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic Theology, and I looked up, I looked faithfulness of God, and it, and it gave us some thoughts that you may want to jot these down and take them home with you, because this, this, is, some, this is some pretty deep statements that are being made here. That, that I think we can start a good conversation this week on our, on our Facebook page. He asked the question, do we limit God by having him conform to our expectations? Think about that. How many things have we asked God to do in our lives that he did not do the way we ask him to, but looking back, we see that he did so much more than what we ask? Kind of like the... the, the the scripture that says beyond all that we, th we think and know, that's how God is. He, he's able to do far more than we could ever imagine. But we limit him based on what we think we want. And when we don't get what we think he should give us, we limit not only the Lord, but we shortcut ourselves in our faith. Have you, ever, have you ever just gone to the Lord and said, you know, Lord, you know my situation. I submit to your will, whatever, whenever. And let him go. Gruden goes on and, and says, how can we define our creator when we are his creation? He says he conforms perfectly to his ideas of what God should be 
because he is God. We are not. Now, I've shared with you all before, that that's my core theology. God is God and I am not. To, to understand that I don't understand is probably the beginning of a relationship with the Lord as the Lord and us as his creation. A lot of what we believe, a lot of what we, we build upon are things that we don't know. But we have faith in God who does and will. And we can rest comfortably, even, even joyfully. We can, we can even rejoice when we face tribulations, we're told. Because we know that God is in control of my life. And I'm good with whatever he has in store. Is that, is that something we can say and really believe? Or do we battle with that? Grudem goes on and says, he, he implants a reflection of his idea of God in our minds, which enables us to recognize him as God. And, and I think what he's saying there is, God is so big and so amazing that just as with Moses and in other cases of Scripture where they could not look at the Lord directly, we see a glimpse, a glimmer of what God is like, which only brings us to our knees in recognition that, that he is God. We recognize him as, as God more than we can think of, more, more than we can comprehend. But at the same time, he is, he is so loving with us that he knows every individual detail of every individual person ever created. Think about that. How, how real is that presence in our life? Another interesting thought. His, his words, his words do not conform to any pattern of truth. His words are truth that everything else conforms to. When we read a scripture and, and, and we say, well, why would God do that? Because he's God. Why, you know, if, if you stop and think about it, what we're studying in, in, in third chapter of Romans, if in the you know, last two weeks we've been talking about the depravity of man, how, how sinful we are from, from the get-go. Why would a perfect God put up with sinful man? I mean, just think about that. He, he created a perfect world, put us in it, fully well knowing we were going to mess it up. And yet, he continues not just to put up with us, but love us as his own, even to the point that he sends his very son to die for us, so that we could have eternity with him. Why would he do that? And, and I think sometimes, I think sometimes we are so overwhelmed by the concept of that that it becomes hard to actually believe and put into real terms in our lives. I mean, th think with me. Have you, have you ever just stopped and thought God put all of this in place for us to worship him in. Everything, nothing, has, nothing, made, nothing that has been made was made by anybody other than God for us to use in worship to him. Yet what have we made it? What, you know, what, what have we done with what he has given us. And how do we, how do we see him in light of, of, of our existence? And when we use terms to describe God, we use terms that we can use, that we know, that we understand. 
but there's so much to God that we can't and don't understand. I wonder if, if we actually see God for who he truly is from his point of view. We can't. So when you look at scriptures, I, I think it's one of those things that I, I, I'm amazed by the way we do it. I do it too. We read something and you say, well, that, that doesn't seem right. Or why would God do that? Or how, how, come, how come we have to do this according to scripture? It's because he said so. We're, we're kind of like the two or three-year-old child that's asking mom or dad, why, why, why? And he says, because I said so. But ask yourself this question, are we really content with that answer? I don't think so sometimes. And I wonder, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? When our kids keep asking questions and we say, because I said so, and they say, well, that's not fair. How do we, how do we feel about those questions being asked? Do you think God is any different? He may well be because he's not like us. We're created in his image. But he's God. And his words, as we said here before, his commands, they don't conform to any pattern of truth. They are the standard that we use as truth. So all that being said gets us to the, to the next question here. Do, <clears throat> do we believe that he can be believed and trusted because a perfect God will always do what he says? If God is, is perfect, and he is, can he make a statement that he will not deliver? Can he make a promise that he'll break? You know, one of, the, one of those questions that you sit around tables and ask, ask yourselves, can God, can God make a commandment that he can't keep? Can God create a rock that he can't move? You know, you, those, those kind of things where, you know, my answer has always been to those, why would he want to? But when, when we look at those things, will God do, we really believe that God will make us a promise that he will not keep. If you go to Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5, it tells us that every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. When we're told there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do we take that at face value? Do, do we believe that? And can we rest in that? If we are truly in Christ Jesus, do we see ourselves as not condemned? Righteous in God's sight. Do, do we really believe that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and my acceptance of him as my Lord and Savior, I am righteous in God's eyes? Do we really, truly believe that? And here's where I think this kind of tests that statement. Faith in God changes everything. If we really believe that, are we living a life that shows that? Or are we worried and anxious or afraid or guilty or, or shamed because of all these things that shouldn't really even exist? Because if our faith is completely in God, we know the statement that says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and he'll forgive us our sins and he'll cleanse us from all that. And our sins are as far away from each other from us as the east is from the west never to be brought back up again. Do we really rest in that or do those, you know, we, I think maybe three or four weeks ago we talked about sins that continue to haunt us. Will we not let go of those? And by not letting go of those, are we exhibiting less than a great faith in God? So if we, if we really have a saving faith in God through Jesus Christ, we surely don't have any worries as far as our salvation, our forgiveness, our grace, our mercy, our life. It should be, it should be 
an abundantly joyful life, just like Scripture says we should be. So if, if our faith is really where it should be, are we really living the life that it, you know, it, it, it describes for us? Have you, heard, have you ever heard the term saving faith? I've used it a couple times last, this morning and this evening. A saving faith is defined as a trust in Jesus as a living person for forgiveness of sins and for eternal life with God. That means that we actually believe that Jesus Christ actually went to the cross, suffered and died for our sins so that we can have forgiveness and eternal life with the Lord. Now, we say we do. But here again, how real is that and how far are we willing to go in our faith for that? Not just a belief in the facts that it happened, but a personal trust in Jesus to save us. Do, you, do we believe that Jesus Christ actually saves us? Yes. Do other people know that in us? Are, are we so confident of that 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 actually has changed our life? And I can't answer that question for you. That's something that we need to, we need to look inward and, and ask ourselves. If, if, I, if faith in God changes everything, and I truly believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I am saved through the redemption in him, why am I still living the life that I live? Or I realize the changes that have taken place in my life, and I'm more confident and more assured and, and, and more at peace than I've ever been before because that is what controls my life. It's no longer, as Paul said, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I believe if we have that, if we have that actual abiding faith of Christ in us, then we see, as we mentioned earlier, we see the, the spiritual over the secular, the eternal over the temporary, as we look at things, when we pray the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, we see the relationship with the Lord and not a loaf of bread from the supermarket. Because that's how Christ sees it, not how we see it. <clears throat> do, do something for me just for a second. On, on, your, on your papers, if you have any papers there with you, you're jotting things down. Write a real short, your word, definition of what salvation is. What is salvation? I'll give you a couple seconds here. <clears throat> I think this might, this might help us see a little deeper too. Is is salvation forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in Christ? Is that is that the definition of salvation? What about sanctification? What about adoption into God's family? What about obedience to the Great Commission? What about the follow-through questions. I, I think many times all we see of salvation is kind of like the kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar. We just want to be forgiven for what we've done and stop it at that. But salvation opens the door to a whole new life. We are not the same as we were. We are a new creation in Christ. Not, not created just to be forgiven for our sins and have a promise of eternal life, I think that's what shortcuts, that's what handicaps us from actually being the, the people that God has called us to be. If we are truly saved, wouldn't our lives be different than just delivered from the sin that we're in? Isn't there more than just that? Because I, I think what happens is we see ourselves as forgiven 
And so we just stop there. I've been delivered from my sins. I'm saved. So I'm going to heaven and I don't have to do anything, anything more. Is that what it is? If we have a faith in God that changes everything, why don't we follow through on that change and live a new life? If we're a new creation in Christ, can we see any real difference in that new creation as opposed to the old man that has now died and gone? Are we a continuation of that or are we truly living a new life? In, in, in this passage, you know, where we are in, in, in Romans, in, in the third chapter, if you will, look with me at verses, let's look at 21 down through 26. We read this this morning. I, I want to take a look at this again, Justifi justification by faith. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. If we go back to 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have a tendency to stop right there. When you quote the scripture, that's where we stop, typically. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But that's just a part of the statement that Paul is making. He goes on and says that those that fall short of the glory of God, it's not just that alone. That's why I wanted to read before that. He's saying that we are justified by faith. Everybody has sinned and fallen short but we're justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That is verse 24. Yeah, we've all sinned and fallen short, but we also have been offered the gift of grace through the redemption in Jesus Christ. And that's what prompted me to ask the question I asked just a little bit ago. Do we, do we see our salvation as just a deliverance from the sin that had us entrapped or do we see a whole new life open up to us are we more are we more excited about the sins that have been forgiven or about the opportunities that lie ahead consider that do you think that do you think that we have been delivered just to be forgiven or to be stewards of what we've been given to worship and glorify the Lord who has delivered us. You see, I think, I think in a lot of cases, we're content to just rest in the forgiveness that we have. But we're called to so much more. We look at the fact that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and we... we we appreciate that and we celebrate that, but we don't read the part that goes on and says, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them, making disciples of them, knowing that the Lord is with us through the whole journey. What do you think, what do you think it would look like if the church put as much emphasis on the Great Commission as it does in forgiveness and mercy? What do you think we'd be like? I mean, think about that. So what are we willing to do because we know we have a saving faith? And what has that done to actually, actually change our lives? Go with me, if you will, to Galatians 
chapter 2. And I want to read verse 16. Well, 15 and 16, I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 says, We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. The law that has condemned us hasn't necessarily been abolished, but it's been completed through our faith in Jesus Christ. We recognize that law, but do we recognize that that law still condemns other people? We're, we're free of it, but do we see the need to be an agent of change in that liberation of other people when, they, when, they, when we show them the gospel and share with them the gospel and lead them to the Lord who begins to work on their heart through the Holy Spirit's conviction? Are we content with what we have or do we want to share it? And if we have a, a true faith in God and everything has changed, we should see that need to share the gospel with other people. That's what Paul, that's one of the main reasons Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. He wants them to rise up as a church and rally around the gospel. And be prepared to take that gospel into the community around them. And when I, when, I, when I make the statement that that letter to Rome is also the letter to Richmond, do we see the Lord calling us as a church to rise up and share the gospel with the community around us? Or do we just see we're a church of good people that are kind of resting on our blessings? What do you think? I think this prompts another question. Why do you think God chose faith to bring about justification? Why not love or joy or peace or humility? Why, why are we not saved by love or saved by peace or saved by humility? Why, why is it faith? What do you think? I think it's because faith is that one descriptor that lets us see that it's not in us. We can't be saved by faith in ourself. We, we can't be saved by anything other than a reliance on Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes that's what makes it so difficult because we, we see only what we can do. But if you, look at, uh, if you look at this faith as being the thing that, that justifies us, you ask the questions, how much faith do we have in ourselves to bring about our righteousness in God's sight? Can we do that? No. We have to depend on something else, somebody else to do that for us. We have to depend on Christ to do that for us. Can, can, can we have faith enough in ourselves to bring about an unswerving dedication to service to the Lord? No, we fall short. We see in Romans where we've been reading that, that no one can do that. Again, we have to go to Christ for that. Can we be completely obedient to his word? We can try, but did anybody in here ever do it? We all sin and fall short, remember? Are there times where we have really good intentions and we want to do what God has called us to do, but we just don't? If we don't have faith in the Lord, if he had not redeemed our sins, we're just adding to our sins and having the law continue to condemn us. So our faith in Christ has to say that I give up we turn our lives over to the Lord. We depend on him to save us from ourselves and bring us into that righteous standing before God. So here's my, the, the main question, the one I want to kind of close with. <clears throat> Where does faith come from? 
What do you think? It comes from God. But where, where do we get that? What, what caused you, us, to begin to have faith in Jesus Christ? We just decided one day we're going to? Just, hey, here's an idea. What if, what if we just had faith in the Lord? You know, if, if you will, go with me to, to uh, Thessalonians. I'm sorry, Romans. Go to, go to Romans chapter 10. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Our faith comes from hearing the word of God spoken to us. The gospel message, if you will. That faith comes from hearing God. Can you remember the day that you began to actually put your faith in the Lord? You know, was it from a, a friend that told you about the Lord? And when you began to look at the gift that was being offered to us, and we looked at our lives all around us, and kind of like what we did this morning with the compass illustration, we began to see the direction that we were headed is not the direction that we needed to be taking. And we realized that we couldn't do it ourselves. Someone had to do that for us. And then we hear that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for us so we could have that done in our lives? Did that cause us to begin to have faith in the Lord? What about the situations where we, we have faith in God because we don't, have any, we don't have anywhere else to go? You ever, you ever, you ever been there? You ever prayed that prayer? God, I don't know what to do. I'm just gonna, you're just going to have to bail me out of this. Is that faith in God? Yeah. Because we realize we can't. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We, we've heard that somewhere. We know that that's true. So we finally come to the end of ourselves and we say, Lord, I can't do this. I need you to. And when we go back to what we read in Romans earlier this morning where it said God remains faithful even though we are liars at heart. Even though we have abused our opportunity, even though we have denied the existence of God in our lives, that doesn't nullify the love that he has for us and the offer that he has for us. As a matter of fact, I would say probably in the truest sense, we have grown in our faith because we've come to the end of ourselves. And we ask the Lord for deliverance or protection or whatever that need is. And when he provides, we actually realize that that was not me, that was God. Can you think of those opportunities where you, you know, maybe we shouldn't be here this evening because of some of the things that we've done? that may even have ended our lives. But God saw fit to save us, to deliver us, to bring us to where we are now in that walk so we can continue to grow in our, in our relationship to him. Do you think that maybe our faith is stunted because we stop at forgiveness? Do you know somebody that has a great faith? Just an amazing faith in the Lord. Do you think that that just came in one lump chunk at them? Or do you think they've experienced things? Do you think they've depended on the Lord over and over? And he's provided over and over. And he, they've drawn closer to the Lord and their faith has gotten stronger. And they're more bold in their Christianity and in their life because they know that with God all things are possible and there are things that I can do only to a point but when I come to that point I can turn it over to the Lord and he'll do much more 
than I ever thought or dreamed because I've gone to him for direction. Are we trusting in God or are we lazy? Ask it that way. And here's what I mean by that. Have you ever just said, well, God's just going to have to do this and we don't act on it? You know, I, I truly believe that the situation we're in right now in this country with this with the COVID thing, I believe that we as a church, universal, not Big Hill Christian Church, but churches in many instances have stopped because they can't see an ending. We say that things are going to get better. We look for them to get better. But then we get the latest reports, and it's bad again. And so we just close down. We just, we just stop. And we say, well, God's just going to have to deliver us. But we're not willing to do anything about it. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> when we pray, do we have faith that God will get us through this? Or are we just so blinded by the darkness that's come around us that we've just stopped? It'd be kind of like us saying, you know, Lord, I, I know that you're going to provide for me, so I'm not going to go to work tomorrow. I put my life in your hands, Lord, you'll provide for me. Is that lazy or is that faith? I think it's lazy. And I think in many cases, we have said, Lord, we need you to get this done. And he said, who will go for us? Like Isaiah. And we haven't said, here I am, I send me. We said, somebody's got to do something. I, I, I'm giving you all a heads up. Tomorrow morning, I, I put out a devotion. <clears throat> and in it, it, it's short, simple, and sweet. I, I, I took three passages of Scripture. One that says we are to encourage one another. And build one another up. The other one says we are to pray for one another. And the last one says we're to pray without ceasing. And I challenge us tomorrow, when, when, when you read this devotion, what do you think will happen? Because I ask, on this post, post an encouraging word so others can be built up post post a prayer request so that others can pray for you and keep those in your mind throughout the day and pray without ceasing for each other and take that encouragement from each other and and what do you think it could make what difference do you think it could make in somebody's life tomorrow if you knew that I was aware of your situation and I'm praying for you and I knew that you had encouraged me and you're praying for me. What difference do you think that could make in the life of somebody? The difference that it will make is based on the faith that we have in the Lord. I truly believe that. If we're obedient to God's word and, and we ask for the Lord to, to be with that person today, that one that has a prayer request, I'm, I'm, I'm ill, or I've got family problems, or, or I'm stressed over a situation, and they know that people are praying for them, and that the Lord is aware of that prayer, and, and that he has told us whatever we ask in accordance with his will, he'll provide, just knowing that, that that person knows that the Lord is aware of their situation, and he's working in their life to bring about his will in their life. What do you think that is, how would you post that up against not having that tomorrow's just monday it's another day and we go back to the grind mill and we just work tomorrow but maybe tomorrow if i ask for prayer and people are praying for me and i know the lord's at work in my life my outlook is different because i'm not looking at give us this day our daily bread as a loaf of bread 
I'm looking at this as give us this day our daily bread, the health and the nutrition and, and the growing and the maturity that I need in the Lord. And it will make a difference. So when we say we can't do anything, I question our faith. If God can part the Red Sea, if God can speak and this world came into being, don't you think he'd give us victory over a, a virus? Maybe. Maybe he's put us in this situation so we will increase our faith in him. And, and we will see him calling us closer to himself. And we don't have all the distractions that we had before. And we're, our, our, our focus is beginning to, to narrow to the Lord because we don't know what's going to happen to us. God, you've got to do something. And he said, I did. That old song, I did. I created you. You be the change that needs to take place in your life and your family and your church and your community. Test me and see, he's saying. If I won't bless you, if I won't, if I won't multiply your faith, if I won't cause you to be an encouragement to somebody else, if I won't, if I won't help you to be a light in a dark world, that city on a hill, all of those things that we're called to be, do you think that just because we're going through a virus that that means we don't have to be Christians anymore? We don't have to have faith in the Lord anymore. You see, I think it's in our intent. If we intend to get beat up in this, we will. But if we intend to overcome this through the Lord, I know we will. Matter of fact, I think once we're on the other side of this, there are going to be stronger churches than they've ever been before. There are going to be people with a deeper belief than they've ever had, a stronger faith than they've ever had because we, we not only healed up physically we healed up spiritually because we saw who did the work it, it was the lord so let me let me close with this verse 27 and 28 in romans chapter 3 says where then is boasting it's excluded by what kind of law of works no, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Take this home with you. How hard have we tried to be good people based on what we can do? There are times we're really good we're giving, we're generous, we're loving, we're thoughtful. We're, we're all those things that a good Christian should be. But then there's times we aren't, right? There's times we fall. And so we think, in order for me to be good again, I've got to do more good things so that I can outweigh the bad thing that I've done. I've got, to, I've got to do three good Christian acts to erase that one sin that I committed. And it may sound kind of silly, but we do that. We have, this, we have this opinion that when we stand before the Lord in judgment, he's going to put all our sins on one side of the scale and all our good works on the other side of the scale. We're just going to see where it pans out. And that's going to determine your eternity. But that's not what Scripture says. You know, this morning I read John 3.16 and 3.17. So if you will, go there. And let me read that one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him not us through him Jesus Christ 
is God's son. The third of the Trinity. He is God. He is going to be the judge on that day. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus will not be condemned. In verse 18, John 3, he who believes in him is not judged. You believe that? Does that make a difference in the way you, you, you see things? I mean, I mean, think about our life up, up to this very moment. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I'm challenging you this evening. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are not judged. But we are commissioned. We have been given a task. And it's not to thank the Lord for the forgiveness of our sins, even though we do. It's to live a life in honor of and worship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. To give back to him the life that he has spared in us. We, we, were, we were saved for a reason. So that we could be the hands and feet of the Lord. And we can only do that if we have faith in him. So go home. Read John three sixteen through 18 again and ask yourself, does my faith in God change everything? Because the way we are so far in Romans, we've come to the realization that we're lost without the Lord. And he has died for us and offers us eternal life through him. And we're at that stage right now to where we either believe or we don't and if we believe there's no condemnation for us we're not judged but if we don't we are so that's digging deeper this evening any any questions any comments anything from this morning okay do you have any prayer requests or anything from, I can't see that far. <laughs> A few prayer requests, if you will. Uh, Art's older sisters, both are going through some difficult times right now. Pray that God will provide uh, them comfort and guidance. Also keep his dad in your prayers. His, his younger brother was, was laid to rest yesterday. Dave Bowling, uh, Shannon McHugh, they're both having, or uh, Shannon McHugh, Dave Bowling's daughter, is having knee surgery on Wednesday. Keep Dave in your prayers, too. He gave me a call yesterday. He has bronchitis. Uh, Kathy Hughes, continuing to pray that the blood clots will dissolve. And Dale's uncle, Tom Hall, he's back in the hospital with fluid around his lungs and uh, kidney failure. Then also, Marion Cornelison's nephew, Marshall Traggett, uh, in your prayers. Keep Madge Noble in your prayers. She's very sick and in a lot of pain after chemo. Uh, last Friday, she went to the ER and, and needs her gallbladder removed. Amanda Spalding uh, is overcoming the emotional aspects of a long recovery and changes in physical abilities. And Sherry Gidley, please keep her Uncle Bob and Bob Fox and family in your prayers as, as he passed away. Any others? I'm sorry? Charlie Friend's brother Mike. Okay. 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 Mike Friend, that's Charlie's uh, brother, has esophageal cancer. Looks like stage four. Uh, lost a lot of weight and going through going through a difficult time. So keep keep him in your prayers as well. Okay.
Oh, Bernard George? Oh, no. Okay. Good to see her here this morning and this evening. Yeah. Yeah, she's my hero. I had one knee. She's had both. Man, that's, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's close the word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for, for, the, for the Lord that you are. Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come here together this evening. And Father, I pray that as we, we've looked at these scriptures and we've looked at some, some hard questions that we, that we begin to, to look to our lives and to, to accept the offer that you've given us, to find joy in, in the relationship that, that we have with you and to realize, Lord, that, that many times we short ourselves of, of blessings and opportunities because we only limit our ability based on what we can do. But you've told us that plainly in scripture that, that all things are possible. So, Lord, help us to, to realize who you are as God, and you don't fit in a box that we've created, but our potential and, and your love for us is unlimited. And, Lord, help us to, to realize that there's a world around us that is searching for answers, and we have what they need in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So, Father, give us a bold spirit. Help us, Father, to open our eyes and to see the opportunities that are all around us and to realize that that all the problems that we face and all the obstacles that are in our way is just the world being the world and you've plainly told us to take heart you've overcome the world help us father to see the spiritual and not the not the secular to, to see the eternal and not the temporary and help us to live that life of victory through jesus christ our lord and savior it's in his name i pray amen thank you all for being with us this evening hope to see you wednesday night as we do our, uh, our Bible study here as well. Thank you.